Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open them to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. And then if you'll find Psalms chapter 47, or 27, Psalms chapter 27 and 26, where we'll begin as well. Everyone in Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, to the believers there. And we'll be looking at this in just a moment and then heading over into Psalms. So praise the Lord, amen. Well, this morning, uh, again, as we're looking into the new year, beginning of a new year, this month of January, the Lord has just kind of led us to look at some things and consider some things to start out the, the new year. Uh, we started on Sunday night, our New Year's Eve service, where the Lord gave a challenge to our church to have a pure heart for 2018. We ought to strive to have a pure heart. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 8 on the Sermon on the Mount, if you recall on the eighth day of Christmas, my true love, God the Father, gave to me eight maids of what? A milking, which represent the eight Beatitudes. And the fifth Beatitude is, as Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so we thank God for that. And that's a challenge to our church for this year to have a pure heart. If you want the blessings of God, you want to see God work and manifested in your life this year, then you're going to have to strive to have a pure heart. A pure heart. Solomon says all the issues of life come from the heart. The Bible says as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we need to have a pure heart for 2018. And last Sunday morning, our first Sunday of the new year, we looked in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we looked at verses 9 through 12 on that fact of living a life that's pleasing to God. Living a life that is pleasing to God. And I think that's a good challenge for us for 2018 is we ought to want to live a life that would be pleasing to the Lord. And one of the ways you can do that is by having a pure heart, okay? And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a little something else that's going to help us to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord and to have a pure heart, and especially that living for God, a life that lives for God. And we're going to talk about distracted living. Anybody been distracted lately? We live today nearly daily in our lives of a, of a life of distraction. And there are so many things that can distract us and keep us from living a life that's pleasing to the Lord, can keep us from having a pure heart, can keep us from living spiritually where we need to be in our spiritual life because we have become so distracted. The Apostle Paul said in chapter 5, and verse number 15, he said, matter of fact, as we begin this new year uh, and, and there are new prospects uh, on the horizon, uh, the Bible challenges you and I to spend our time wisely, uh, avoid wasting opportunities. And we're going to have a lot of opportunities this year, and we don't want to waste them. But we can if we live distracted living. And so Paul said to the church of Ephesus, he said, See then, now by the way, this is a present imperative command. This is not an option. We're commanded by the apostle that we walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. Why? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. How many believe we're living in evil days and evil times? And therefore, we must walk wisely, circumspectly, and we must redeem the time. Notice the time. We all operate on time. Everything we do evolves around time. The clocks, the watches, time schedules, you name it. Are you redeeming your time wisely or are you being distracted? Are you living wisely and walking circumspectly with the Lord and redeeming that time in your life and walk with the Lord or are you living a life that's distracted by so many distractions? We're going to look at seven biblical texts this morning. 
of where the, the Word of God instructs us, if we will apply those things in our lives this year, we can live a life from distraction. If not, we're going to continue to live a life of distraction and being distracted by everything. And we don't want to do that. And we'll take a look at that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and mercy and for your love. And Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us, guides us, teaches us. And Lord, he guides us into all truth. He teaches us all truth. He reveals the truth to us. The Bible says he brings to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. And certainly we would ask that this morning of him, that he would bring those things to our mind, that the things that Jesus has shared with us in our hearts and, and, and taught us in his word this week. Lord, we ask for your power, your anointing on this hour. Father, that you would speak through your servant today. And Lord, that we could be your mouthpiece. And fathers, we sow the seed, the word of God into hearts today. May it fall on good soil. And Lord, may we take what we hear and apply it to our lives, that we might redeem the time wisely, because truly the days are evil in which we're living. And Lord, if there's one here today that's never trusted Christ, may today be the day they come to know Jesus, whom to know is life everlasting. And Father, those that are watching by television, radio, internet, YouTube, the iPads, the iPhones, the tablets, Oh, thank you, God, for all the ways that we can reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Save a multitude of souls today for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. How many of you would agree, and if you'll just follow along in your study guide with me this morning, we'll kind of get going here just for a way of introduction. But how many of you would agree with me today that many of us are overwhelmed and distracted? Did you agree with that? I've had a lot of distraction these past few months. Already a lot just in these first two weeks of the new year. So I wonder why God brings this message to my heart. Because I'm having to deal with it myself. And so if I'm dealing with it, I know you have to too. So maybe there's some things that can help us from the Word of God today. I know they can. Countless things cloud our minds and what? Demand our immediate attention. Boy, have I experienced that recently. Matter of fact, just to give you an example of distracted living, I looked up one of the statistics, and this is from 2015, just to get an idea about distracted living. Did you know that in 2015, there were 3,500 deaths and 400,000 injuries due to distractive driving? Just that alone in 2015, and I'd probably say the majority of it was text phones. For all you texters out there, be careful. But there's a greater danger we face today, church. How many lives today do you know that are ruined, families that are wounded, opportunities are lost due to complacency of distracted living? The scripture abounds in here with tragedies of that and examples that we could go through and spend a lifetime just looking at them. Man, even Gideon, the distractions that Gideon had uh, as we see in his life just as we've been looking at him in Sunday school for the last few weeks and many of the other Old Testament uh, prophets and, and leaders and losers and, and learners that we've looked at in Judges and as we continue to do so. So how? How do you and I, how do we keep focused today, church? when distractions abound all around us. How do we do that in this new year? Because they're going to come, and they're already hitting you. And I want to live a life, I know about you, pleasing to God from a pure heart. And I would sure like to have a year this year without so many distractions. They're not going to go away. They're going to be there, and they can become daily in our lives, and they can overwhelm us and cloud us in our spiritual walk with the Lord if we don't learn how to handle them and how to deal with them. And I think the Scripture is going to give us seven beautiful biblical texts that we're going to look at that are going to help us as we focus on it. So how do we stay focused when distractions abound? Well, there are, there are follow, we're going to follow seven biblical texts that are focused on one thing. 
I was reading an article in a Christian magazine about distracted uh, distractions. And this thing, one thing. So I like to type in words, one thing. See how many times it appears in Scripture and, and take it from there and see what, and kind of follow it through the Scripture and follow its thread line to see if there's anything that the Word of God would help us with this on focusing on one thing. I believe there are seven things as we go through this that we need to focus on. Focus on that we need to do. Let's not be hearers of the word only today, but let us be doers of the word of God, and that man's deeds will be blessed. But we've got to be doers. By God's grace, if we will apply these things, these biblical things, we will be able to redeem our time in the days ahead and stay on the right path. If not, we're going to get distracted. And what happens when you get distracted? Be careful in the days ahead as the road begins to tear up out here. There'll be signs that'll say, workers ahead, slow down. There'll be detour signs. If you don't pay attention to them and because you're distracted, no telling where you may end up. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's, let's take a look at the first one. We find it in the book of Psalms. David challenges us in the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 27, if you would, please. Everybody in Psalm chapter 27. And let's see what our wonderful brother David has to share with us. David had a desire in his heart, uh, to sought, and he sought after one thing. David sought after one thing. If you're going to keep from living distracted living, there's one thing you're going to have to seek after. Listen to what David said in Psalm chapter 27, if you would, in verse number 4. Circle the word. Here's some phrases for you. Circle the phrase, one thing have I desired. Are you with me? Say amen. The first thing you need to see this morning is one desire. If you're going to keep from, from distracted living, you're going to have to have one desire. Not a hundred desires, but one desire. Now that gets it kind of narrowed down for us, doesn't it? We need to have one desire. Look what he says. David says, I have but one desire, verse 4, of the Lord that I will seek after. I hope you've got one desire this morning of the Lord that you will seek after. Let's see what it is. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see the three things there that David said he wanted to do? Anybody catch them? He said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He said that I may behold his beauty of the Lord and that I may inquire in his temple. David's one passion and thirst was to long for God, was to have a fellowship a relationship, and to walk with the Lord. And he said, I'm going to find, now in the Old Testament, he, I'm going to find that in his sanctuary, in his temple, in his synagogue, because that's where God met with his people in the Old Testament. That's where God's presence was. That's where God's beauty was. That's where God's covenant was. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, which represented the presence of God. That's where the glory of God was. And David said, I have a desire. I have but one thing, he says. That is to focus on a relationship and a walk with the Lord. David didn't want an unbroken fellowship or walk with the Lord. And I want to tell you, church, things that will distract you will break your fellowship with the Lord. They'll cause you to focus on everything else but the Lord. You see, this is one thing you got to do. You got to get a desire in your heart. One thing, God, I want to walk with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to experience your beauty, your joy, your glory in my life. Now, in the Old Testament, of course, that was in the synagogue, in the temple, uh, in the church, because that's where God met. We know today that God doesn't uh, dwell in, this, in buildings today. God dwells in the heart of believers, in the person of the Holy Spirit, and resides and lives within us. Matter of fact, there hasn't been a temple in Jerusalem for 2,000 years. Matter of fact, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple 2,500 years ago. That's why you see all of the Jews go to the Wailing Wall, and they go there because it's the closest thing to the temple where God's glory was. It's the closest thing where God's glory left. They have uncovered a tunnel and, 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 and going through it and excavate, excavate, excavating it. And they found a tunnel that they feel is right in perfect line to where the Holy of Holies was. And 
they go and stand in that, hoping to have, uh, to, to feel that presence and walk with the Lord. Church, you've got him in your heart today if you're saved. And you can walk and experience the joy of the Lord and the glory of the Lord in your personal walk with Christ if you won't let everything distract you. There's a lot of distractions out there. So I trust the first thing, number one, the one biblical principle you want to apply is just like with David. Have that desire in your heart today. Have that desire to seek to know the Lord, to have that relationship, his beauty, his fellowship, your walk with him. You see, in the cool of the garden, every day God is present with you. But sometimes we don't even realize it because we're so distracted. And everything is distracting us in our living, in our walk. I'll tell you how you can keep from living distracted living. Have a desire in your heart to have an unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Guess what? Sin will break your fellowship with the Lord too, church. So what's the one desire you're going to have today? What's that desire? For you to have an unbroken fellowship with the Lord in your daily walk. In your daily walk. If not, you're going to let the things of this world distract you in that relationship. And you're going to be living distracted living instead of victorious living. Let's look at another one now. I'm going to take you to a second thing we can apply in our lives. So we're going to look at one word in each of these biblical texts. The one is the one desire. That's to have an unbroken fellowship with the Lord. Let's look at the next one. Turn to Luke's gospel. Well, wait a minute. Before you go there, if you're still there in Psalms. In verse 8, David says, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. And the place where thy honor dwelleth. Let me ask you something. Do you have a desire for God's house today? I left that out, so I'm not going to move on to the second one because i got to cap on this a little bit. If you want to keep from getting distracted today, you need to have a desire for God's house. You need to have a desire to come to God's place of worship. Folks, even though the Spirit of God lives in you, I want to tell you something. God has still chosen to meet with his people right here. Right here in this place. Matter of fact, he said, where two or more of you are gathered, in my name, there's the gathering. That's the ecclesia. That's the called out body of Christ. Okay, that's what the word ecclesia means. The called out body of Christ, the church. We have gathered here together to meet together. And God says when we do, guess what? I'm here. I show up. And here's where we fellowship with the Lord. Here's where God says, I have chosen to answer your prayers even. Here's where God says, this is an altar in here for prayer time. This is where we come to pray to the Lord. Here's where we have fellowship with other believers. Here's where we fellowship with the Lord in music and in the Word. Do you have that desire? uh, Are you going to become so distracted this year that we won't hardly ever see you? Got quiet in here. You see, that's what happens. What keeps believers out of church? What keeps them from coming and having that desire to be in God's house? They're distracted by everything under the sun. And guess what? You find yourself living in distracted living because you're so distracted that you can't even come to God's house and be a part of the fellowship and and meet here uh, and have a great time in the Lord. That's why we're here. And David David said, I have a desire to be there all the days of my life. Wouldn't matter to me if we had church every night. Thank you, sister. I love it here. I love coming here. I love being here. Love singing the songs and hearing the piano and people play. And now we got another string instrument playing with us, the guitar. And we're getting another gun pumped up in the guitar. And, and uh, come before the Lord with stringed instruments and praise the Lord. And, I mean, I, I love that. What better else than that? No, I see, you all want to go home and watch Super Bowl. Now, how many of you are going to be here on February the 5th? Oh, the preacher's gone to Medlin now. No, I'm not. Where's your desire today? Are you going to be distracted by the Super Bowl? Or are you going to come to God's house? Hello. I love you. But I'm just telling you the truth. Who cares about the Super Bowl? 
You want to have a super Sunday, you come here and we'll have a super Sunday with God's people and God's spirit and we'll see if the Holy Ghost won't show up and touch some of you where you can get happy in the Lord and see what God does and we'll have a Super Bowl Sunday. Don't get so distracted, folks, in your daily living that it keeps you from God's house because it'll happen. Trust me, it'll happen. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 10 now. Now we'll move on. Here we go. Luke chapter 10. Are we ready? Everybody in Luke chapter 10. All right, in Luke chapter 10, I'm going to bring your attention to two sisters. How many of you remember Martha and Mary? Everybody remember Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10? Okay, Jesus is coming to town, and uh, Martha and Mary decide they want to host a dinner for, on behalf of Jesus in honor of Jesus. And we pick it up in verse number 38 of Luke chapter 10. Now it came to pass as they went, and he entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also, notice the difference now, there are two women who are going to make two choices. One's going to make one choice, one's going to make another choice. Okay? And Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and heard his word. Keep that phrase in mind. But Martha was what encumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her. I mean, Mary, Martha was upset. She was rebuking Mary. Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Now Jesus is going to answer her. And Jesus said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Martha was distracted and overwhelmed with serving and everything that was going on. And Jesus said, Martha, you're, you're, you're worried, you're frustrated about too many things. Martha, you're distracted about too many things. Now, we could take Martha's side and say, well, hey, after all, man, Jesus has come to the house here. I mean, how often do we get this guest? And we want everything right. We want to get everything done just right and the table set just right and our finest china and everything. Oh, we just, and we just, I mean, we, we build ourselves up into a frenzy over it. And Mary just goes over and sits down at the feet of Jesus. And Mary began to listen to Jesus expound on the Word of God. You following me? And Martha got all upset. And he said, oh, Martha. Now watch this. Look what Jesus told her. You ready for the next verse? Verse 42, circle it. But one thing is needful. Martha, you need one thing. Here it is. And Mary hath chosen that good part. In other words, Mary chose right. Okay? Which shall not be taken away from her. All right, when there was one thing that was needed, Martha became so distracted by the ongoing of God and get this and do this. And, and Jesus said, not just the serving, but he said, Martha, you're, you're, you're worried about many things. She was so distracted in her life that she couldn't take time out to sit at the feet of Jesus and spend time in the Word. He said, there's one thing you lack, Mark, need, Martha, and that is you need to listen to the Word of God. How are you going to have a walk in a fellowship and have that desire to be here if you don't want to hear the Word? You see, church, we can get so distracted that we bypass even spending time in this book. And everybody needs this book. Everybody needs God's Word. Man, if Jesus comes to your house, I want to sit and listen to him. I don't care what else is happening. See, Martha, Mary realized that, hey, the Master's here, and I'm going to take in the Word of God into my life, and I'm not going to let all these other things distract me and keep me from the Word of God. And what's needed in your life and in my life to keep you and I from being so distracted, so worried, so fr uh, or frustrated by so many things, we need to take time out for God's Word. There's a need for God's Word in your life today. Have you become so distracted, folks, that you don't even pick this book up until you come to church on Sunday? Boy, 
it got quiet in here. Have we become so distracted and so busy that we cannot redeem our time properly? As Paul said, because the days are evil, we can't even take time out for God's word in our lives. You know, Jesus said, you're not going to live by bread and water alone, but you can live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm just too busy. You're too busy. Preacher, I just got so many things going on, and I'm so distracted by so many stuff in my life, and I'm just, you know, going on and on. Then, folks, you're too distracted. You're too busy if you can't take time out to sit at Jesus' feet and take in some words, some scripture. Martha, you're too worried and you're too busy. And there's one thing that's needed. You need that good part that Mary chose. You need the Word of God in your life, Martha. Don't worry about setting the table for me. We'll eat later. But what's important, you need the Word of God. Folks, if not everything in the world, I'll tell you, today we got everything distracting us from the Word of God, even churches today. I was listening to a guy last night for about an hour, and his message was entitled this, Worshiptainment. Worshiptainment. Entertainment. Worshiptainment. Instead of entertainment, he called it worshiptainment. Worshiping God in the wrong way. And boy, that's what we've got today. Our worship has become a worshiptainment to satisfy the, the, the appetite of the flesh and to appeal to the entertainment of the flesh, and that's what we got. And that's what they do, and that's what they have. And they're willing to pay the price and to pay the money to have it all so that they can entertain the flesh and satisfy and appease the flesh with all the stuff that's going on with the entertainment, and that's why they do it. And, folks, that's not worship. That's not biblical worship. That's worshiptainment. And they never get the work, word. They get all the entertainment they want. They get the flesh satisfied. They get the appetites of the flesh. And then they get their feelings. You see, it's called, it's called feeling ministry anymore. See, ministry is not about feelings. Ministry is not about meeting our basic, our needs of our flesh and appetizing our flesh and meeting our feelings that we have. No, ministry is, folks, is ministering the Word of God to the spiritual part of man that needs the Word of God so that they can grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And then, by the way, worship is not about entertainment. Worship is not about the wild music, the wild lighting, the strobe lighting, the discos, the smoke the pyro. Folks, that's just satisfying the flesh of people and meeting their feelings. Worship is about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship is about the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ and magnifying His name and glorifying His name and presenting Him and presenting the gospel to a lost world, not getting you to jump around on the platform. And they're distracted even in that service of even meeting with the Lord. One need. So you got one desire, that's to have an unbroken fellowship with the Lord. You ought to have one need, and that need is, and I've asked the question there, how eager are you today to focus on the Word of God? How eager have you been to focus on God's Word lately? Or are you focused on everything else? See, distracted living will get you to focus on everything else but God's Word. And I'll tell you who's behind all that. Old Splitfoot himself. The devil doesn't want you focused on the things of God and the Word of God, and he'll get you distracted even in ministry. Hello. People sometimes in the church want to run the pastor around like a chicken with his head cut off. And you can become so distracted you haven't even got time to get in the Word or time to prepare. Dr. Horton taught at PCC that for every minute of study and for every 60 minutes of study requires a minimum of eight hours of study for every 60 minutes now multiply times that four times a week 32 hours i don't have time to be running around amen i'm preaching to myself here so don't get mad so we got one desire we got one need let's go to the next one galatians chapter 5 turn to galatians chapter 5 paul is dealing with the galatians here that are struggling in their christian life of living free in christ 
You know, he talks about freedom, that we are free in Christ with the grace of God because God's grace gives us freedom in the Lord. Amen? Because we're living under God's grace, not under the law. Okay? And so, but he says, don't take and use that license of your grace and that freedom to go out and live in sin. Don't use your license to ignore and to obey God's moral law. You see, even though we're not under the law, we still have to obey God's moral law, folks. And so the Galatians were dealing and struggling with this, and Paul's trying to let them know that, no, there is freedom in Christ. There is a grace of God that gives us freedom, and he wraps it up in one word. One word. You see, you need one desire, you need one need, and you need one word. How many of you want to know what that one word is? Can somebody tell me? Look in Galatians chapter 5, if you would, please, in verse number 14. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 14. Everybody with me? Here it is. For, talk, talk to me. For what? All the law is fulfilled in what? Here's my, here's your, here's your number three. Here's where I got this. One word. Is fulfilled in what? One word, even this. Here's the word. Here's the one word. Thou shalt what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. See, you can't, you, you, you can't love people if you're distracted. You see, you got to love people. The whole fulfillment of the law is found in one word. How many of you love yourself today? You see, we look at here. We have to obey the moral law. You see, Paul was encouraging the believers not to, to live free in their grace and the liberty of their grace, but he still reminded them that you have to obey the moral law. And the moral law was filled in one word. That's your third one there, one word. What is that one word? Love. Love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you love yourself today? Come on, be honest. Raise your hand. You love yourself. You know you do. All right, then you know what? As much as you love yourself, you ought to love your neighbor. Hello. That's the moral law. You see, if not, everything's going to distract us. But if not, we've got to have one word, love. Love covers a multitude of sins, folks. Doesn't mean we have to agree with it and prove it, but it's just saying love. The grace should be free in our hearts to truly love others. That's what Paul was saying. If you've got the grace of God, you Galatian believers, since you've got Christ now and since you've been saved, you have the grace of God. You're no longer under the law of the Old Testament because the law is death. The law would put you to death if we still under the law. Thank God for that. The wages of sin is death. The law demanded the death penalty, and Jesus came and fulfilled the law. He paid the price and died on the cross for you and I so we could live free in His grace. But that doesn't mean we stop loving people. We must love one another. You see, yes, there's going to be all kinds of pressure and stuff. Grace frees me to serve and to love you. So how have you gone out of your way lately to demonstrate sacrificial love to someone? Have you gone out of your way this year already to show love to someone? Or have you so distracted, you're so caught up in yourself and so busy with everything you're doing that you can't see to love someone else, but yet you don't fail to stand in front of the mirror? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just so in love with myself, I can't stand it. Whoa. Why, people all around us are hurting, church. And they need to see the love of God coming from your heart. You see, distracted living is going to keep you from loving others. Distracted living will keep you from the Word of God. Distracted living will keep you from a close walk in fellowship with the Lord. And you got a whole year of it coming, I'm telling you. And it's already hit me hard. So this message is for me. So I saw that. Let's go to the fourth one. Got to hurry. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Back to Luke chapter 18. Everybody in Luke chapter 18? This is the story, you know, the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus, and he asked Jesus there in verse 18, beginning in verse number 18. He asked the Lord, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question, amen? Those of you that are watching by television with us today and, and are listening on the radio and the internet, and, and you have the question, what must I do to have eternal life? Well, before we get into this passage of Scripture, let me just tell you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what you do. And Jesus, went, and Jesus began to use a, a talk with this young man because he knew the young man's heart. 
Look what he says. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. Jesus gave me five commandments of the Ten Commandments, and those five have to deal with the relationship with man. Okay? Did you see that? Notice that in there? And he said, and notice, the young man responded immediately. He didn't bother to think. He's like so many of us. We, we get our mouth in motion before we get our brain in gear. Amen? And just spontaneously, he, he just, boom, right off the bat. Well, I've kept all these from my youth. Now, Jesus didn't argue with him. Jesus didn't call him a liar. But Jesus knows his heart, say amen. Jesus is trying to get this guy to see his heart. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto thee, Yet lackest thou one thing. The word we're looking for is lack. One lack. You lack one thing, young man. You lack one thing. He says, go and sell all that you have, give it unto the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. Now, notice, when the young man heard this, he was sorrowful because he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And he went on with that. You see, the young man did not go away sorry because uh, he, he was, his heart was exposed. Jesus exposed his heart to his sin problem of that of riches and, 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 and gain and profit, you see. No, Jesus exposed his heart to who he really was on the inside. He wasn't sorry that he got his sin exposed and the, and, the, and the look of his heart. He was sorry because he had to give up his great wealth and his riches. And so he went away sorrowful. You see, what, this, what we like to look at this, Jesus said you got one thing you're lacking, young man, your self-evaluation. You see, that young man evaluated himself at how good he was, how righteous he was, how, uh, that he had kept all the, the, the commandments that he was, you see, and spouted that off to Jesus immediately, rather than really taking an honest evaluation of his heart and seeing the spiritual condition that he was in. And that's what happens to us sometimes. Sometimes we don't take time out, church, to look at the spiritual condition of our heart, to do a truthful, honest evaluation. And that's what we're lacking. See, there's one thing you lack. There's one desire, you need to have an unbroken fellowship with the Lord. You need to have one need, you need to have the Word of God in your heart and in your life. You need to have one word, the Word of love, but you're lacking something. You're not evaluating yourself spiritually, honestly, like you ought to. That's why Paul said over in Romans that we ought not to think higher of ourselves than we ought to think. Sometimes we all think we're pretty good, and we're pretty self-righteous. And we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do this, we do this and that, and don't run here and run there. And oh, aren't we wonderful? No, if the truth be known, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. If the truth be known, there's none righteous, no, not one, in Romans chapter 3. If the truth be known, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. If the truth be known, we've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. Therefore, we have all sinned and come short and missed the mark of the glory of God. That's a true self-evaluation. So there's one thing we lack. You see, we can let so many things distract us in our living and in our thinking. We don't take time to truly, honestly evaluate where we are in our spiritual life. How are you doing in your spiritual life today? Do you have that one desire? Then you need to work on your spiritual life that David had. Do you have that one need, a need for the Word of God in your life? You see, if not, then you see... You haven't been evaluating your spiritual life too well. Can I get some amen or somebody to agree with me at least? Okay? If you're not loving others, then guess what? You, and you say what well, you say you are, but you're not. You've got a spiritual need. You're not truly, honestly evaluating your spiritual life. And this, this is what Jesus was trying to get this young man to do, to take a real close, honest look at himself and realize, and yet the man went away because, hey, man, I've got too many riches to give up. Oh, my friend, let's take a, when was the last time, church, you thoroughly, thoroughly and honestly evaluated your spiritual life today? Where are you spiritually today with Christ? Is it where it needs to be? Was it better this last year that we just finished in 2017 than it was in 2016? Then if not, there's room for improvement, isn't there? And if we continue to go on, then you see we haven't truly, really, honestly evaluated our hearts and lives where we're at. All right, so let's look at the next one real quick. That's found in John chapter 9, 
Turn to John chapter 9. All right? Everybody in John chapter 9? Real quick. John chapter 9. Here we go. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a man born blind. We won't go through the story. You find that in verses 1 through 9. They asked, was this his mother, his parents that caused this sin or his sin? And Jesus said, no, neither, no, neither, that the, that the word of God might be glorified in it, and God's work may be glorified in it. But it, it comes along, what happens, and this man is going to be miraculously touched by Jesus, and he's going to get not only physical sight from the light of the world, but he's also going to get spiritual sight. Amen. You see, he's going, to go from, he's going to go from darkness to light. He's going to go from being blind to seeing, both physically and spiritually. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Because he'd been touched by the Word of God. And there was one thing that this man had that's going to keep you and I from being distracted this year. The question, and then, then we come to verse 25, and the religious leaders question this man. Pick it up with me in verse number 25, John chapter 9. They came and they questioned him. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. He's talking about the man. He couldn't even describe who Jesus was. But look at this. One thing. I know that where I was, I was blind, and now I see. He says, there's one thing I know. Are you listening to me, church? This is how you ought to be today. There's one thing you ought to know today. You ought to know that if you were blind, that you now see. You ought to know that if you were lost, you're now saved. If you, ought to know, you ought to know today, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that if you were walking in darkness, now you're walking in light because you have met the Savior. I don't care how the world gets. I don't care how distracted you get. You ought to have an awareness about you today, about your salvation. No matter how distracted living gets with you, no matter how much distraction's going on, there's this one thing I know, preacher. I know I'm being distracted. I know things are bombarding me. I know the days are evil. I know my time and everything. But there's one thing that I know. I once was lost, but now I can see. I'm found. I'm found. I once was blind, but now I can see by the power and the glory of God I have been saved. And this man had an awareness of his salvation. When's the last time you had an awareness of your salvation with all the distractions that's going on in your everyday life that you become so distracted you can't even remember when you got saved? You become so distracted with all the distraction of life you can't even share the one truth, and that's the word, the one truth. You need to know the one truth, that you've come from darkness to light. You were blind, now you see. You were lost, but you were found. I love what this man says. Look at it. He tells in verse 35, look at it. He says, Jesus heard that he was cast out. And then you go through the story. Those guys got so upset with him, they kicked him out of church. They expelled him from the synagogue because he said, I don't know who this man was. He said, I don't know if he was a heathen or who he was. All I know is that he touched me. And when he did, I got my sight. I could blind and I could see. I know that I was in darkness and now I'm walking in the light. And he said, man, at that point, the man didn't care who it was. He'd been miraculously and gloriously changed by the power of God. And he knew it. And he didn't mind telling anybody else around him. He said, do you believe it? And Jesus met him later on in the temple. Look at this. Jesus heard that he was cast out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, dost thou believe on the Son of God? Look at the answer of this man. He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with you. Woo! Glory to God. Friend, do you, are how aware of you of your salvation today? Do you have a vivid awareness of the truth of your salvation today in spite of all the distractions? Have you gotten so distracted in everyday living that you've even forgotten you got saved? And the joy of your salvation? And that you know that you're saved? Calm down. Take some time out. Amen? Number six, the objective. Real quick, the objective. How many of you believe that our world is a busy world? Days and weeks fly by. It seems like we we'll never have enough time to get everything done. Can everybody agree with me on that? Man, there just ain't enough time in a day, in a night, in a month, in a year. I'm there, brother. Each day I've got tasks to complete. I've got people to meet. I've got obligations to fulfill. Man, my schedule is so, so, so busy, I've got to prioritize it. 
Somehow i got to prioritize my time. So you're going to get your cell phones out, all of you that got iPads. And you put your schedule in there, and you schedule all your time. And you and you got a calendar. you got a booklet that Dr. Woodward made for us, and a calendar. So you can write everything in there. And you begin to prioritize, prior, prioritize your time and, and everything in your day and your schedule and your business and all that gets done. Let me ask you something. Have you taken the time to prioritize your time with God? Are you so distracted? You have no time for God. There's 168 hours in a week. 168 hours in a week. Okay? Now, if you come to church on Sunday morning only, that's 45 minutes. We'll give you an hour. So what in the world do you do with the other 167 hours of your time? Hello? Even if you come Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you got a whole little over two and a half hours total time out of 168 hours in the week. That's less than 2%. I think we got our priorities out of line. We prioritize more of our time doing everything else and all the distractions of distracted living than we do prioritizing our time with God. You see, there's one objective you need to have today. If you're going to live apart from distracted living, you need to prioritize some time with God. Put it in your schedule. Put it in your daily routine. That's what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said that in Philippians chapter 4. You want to turn here real quick? We'll look at it. Philippians chapter 3. I should have given you that a little while ago. Ephesians, Galatians, come on, you'll get there. Everybody there in Philippians chapter 3? Real quick, we're wrapping it up here. We're just about done. Give me just a few more minutes. Philippians chapter 3, if you would, please. Everybody in Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, the Apostle Paul speaking here, I count myself to have apprehended, but this, talk to me, one thing I do. Paul says, here's what I'm going to do to keep from being distracted and living a distracted life. I'm going to forget those things which are behind, and I'm going to reach forth for those things which are before I'm going to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, you need to prioritize your time with the Lord. You know what Paul was saying, really? Paul says, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I want to become more like Christ every day in my life. I want to look forward to the walk with Christ, to the fellowship with Christ. Matter of fact, look down at verse 10. He wraps it up when he comes down to verse 10. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Paul said, I'm going to prioritize my time more now that I may know Christ and become more like Christ and to know the power of his resurrection, to know his fellowship, to know his suffering, to know him greater. Because why? The days are evil, and we must walk wisely and redeem the time. And Paul says, I'm going to redeem some of my time and prioritize it to being with God. Amen? How does your pursuit of your spiritual growth today impact your daily schedule? Do you take time out for God in your busy daily schedule for spiritual growth? You will if you have a desire to fellowship with Him. You will if you have a need for the Word of God. You will if you have the love of God in your heart. You will if you learn to lack one thing, you see. You will if you have that, those things that we're talking about. You will if you have that one truth, the awareness of your salvation. You ought to be so aware of your salvation and where you go. You ought to jump up and down and shout hallelujah. Amen. And praise God. And the last one we find over in our dear brother Peter. You won't have to turn to it. We must finish. How many would you agree with me years ago for you older folks have been around that in our churches and our services that our pastors and their sermons were filled full of future judgment, the tribulation, the rapture of the church, the millennium. How you remember those days? Well, there wouldn't be weeks go by that our pastors wouldn't have a message on it. Today we hardly ever hear about it. We hardly ever talk about it anymore. That's why we've been going through our prophecy series. And here in a few weeks, as we get our stuff and material together, we're going to be starting an entire series on the rapture of the church. When, why, where, how, what? Taking that major doctrine. It's a doctrine in the Bible that has been forgotten. 
that's not being taught today, you see. Oh, you see, my friend, how do you and I talk and live today? See, in the old days, uh, in our churches, our folks, and the people I grew up with under me, my Sunday school teachers, training teachers, and all of them, they were constantly talking about the rapture of the church. They were looking every day for the coming of the Lord. You know why we're not doing that today? Because we're too distracted. We've let too much distraction of the world take us away from the very fact that Jesus is coming again. And I'm telling you, friend, he could come today. The imminent return of Jesus Christ could happen right now. The question is, are you ready? Are you living that way, expecting Christ to come? You see, that's what Paul said. Uh, that's what the Peter said. Peter said, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. I'm telling you, the day of the Lord is on the horizon. His promises are irrevocable. Nevertheless, Peter says, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth, which in righteousness dwells. Let me ask you something more. How sure is your hope of the promise of Jesus' return at any moment? You see, the one word you need there, remembrance. If you're going to live for free from distracted living, you need to remember, church, that Jesus, the imminent return of Christ, could happen right now. There's nothing else to be done, nothing else to be, there's no signs. Signs are all for the second coming. Folks, there's no signs for the imminent return of Christ. There's no signs for the rapture of the church. It can happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump and the shout, come up hither, and we're gone. But have we become so distracted with life, we forgot about that. Are we living so distracted we don't even think about the Lord coming back? Remember. You see, it's easy for you and I to become distracted and to lose focus, church, on what counts. This year, let's evaluate and reorder our lives so we live wisely and purposely, impacting others for eternity. One desire, unbroken fellowship. One need, focus on the Word of God. One word, love. One lack, an honest evaluation of our spiritual condition. One truth, a vivid awareness of our salvation. One objective, the pursuit of Christian spiritual growth as we press towards the mark. One remembrance, church. The Lord is coming back in the clouds of glory. Are you ready? Do you know Him? Have you been saved? Are you born again? If not, now's the time to do so. Brother Marvin, come. David, come. Bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. We're finished. Thank you for your patience. Distracted living. How distracted are you today? Are you redeeming the time today because they're evil? Is there so much going on in your life that we have failed in these seven areas? to have these that the scripture admonishes us, exhorts us to do because I'm just too busy, preacher. I'm just so distracted. I've got so much to do. I'm overwhelmed with my schedule. I don't have enough time. Oh, friend, that sounds like all of us here. We're living distracted living and we can change it by the choices and decisions we make. If we will just take these seven biblical principles and apply them in our life, it can help us to have victory in our spiritual walk. Friend, if you're here today without Christ and not saved, you can't do any of this until you're saved. You need to know the Lord and come to Christ. Be born again. Those of you that are watching by television, Look at your TV screen. Don't turn it off. Stay right there. Don't turn it off. This is the most important thing. Friend, if you died today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? Are you 100% sure that heaven would be your home if you died right now? Or if Jesus was to come back right at this moment, are you ready for heaven? If not, you can be. You can prepare both ways. You can get prepared for death, and you can get prepared for the rapture of the church by coming to Christ and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior. If you're in this auditorium, the same thing goes for you. If you haven't done that, pray with us. It's not the prayer that saves you now. It's putting your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary and what He did for you. Friend, if you're willing to believe that and to trust that by faith, would you pray with us right now? 
Simply pray, dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or at the rapture, whichever comes first. And I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you for being with us, watching and listening today. We'll trust many of you came to Christ. We love you. God loves you. We don't see you. We'll see you on the way up. We'll see you in glory until we meet again. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. And may his face cause to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Church, let's stand.